Hello everyone, this is Nairi from Low Carbon Fasting. Well, this episode is part of the series on this channel called Type 1 Diabetics Talk, where both hosts and guests are type 1s and you guessed it, we discuss type 1 diabetes. I am honored to have uh, three wonderful Hello, type ones, obviously wonderful people as my guests today. Uh, so I have Paul and Bridget. Bridget, do you want to wave so people can? Okay, and Sarah. Um, so these three wonderful people are actually admins of one of, I have to say, I'm not being biased here, but one of my favorite type one groups on Facebook because I appreciate the good work you're doing. You don't allow the nonsense to pass by and the misinformation because you take you take the advice being shared in your group really seriously. So I do appreciate the aspect of it because that's what I do in my groups as well. Um, I don't want to be playing the authoritarian figure, but I also don't want false information to be passed you know, in my group. So I take it seriously. Um, okay, so the group I'm talking about for anyone who's not a member, please request to join the group. The group name is Latent Autoimmune Diabetes in Adults. And you guessed it, that's a lot of diabetes. This is what we're going to discuss today. First of all, shall we start with your personal stories? When were you diagnosed? Um, and then we'll move on to how you manage your type 1 diabetes. I'm calling it type 1 diabetes specifically. And we're going to come to that the, to, to that point too later on because that's one of the topics I'd like to discuss. Let's start off with your diagnosis story. Who's going first? <laughs> I nominate Sarah. <laughs> okay. I've been I've been voluntold that I'm going first. Um, <laughs> So I was diagnosed, um, actually, I'm going to go back pre-diagnosis. So I had gestational diabetes with my second child. Um, I had him when I was 35 years old. Um, my blood sugar, of course, you know, returned to normal um, after I gave birth. And then over the, because of that, my primary care physician said, you know, we should really continue to monitor your A1C at every checkup because it's very common for women who have had GDM gestational diabetes mellitus to develop type two later on. And so this was happening every year at my physical. And then after about five years, we started seeing that A1C kind of creeping up, but it was still in that non-diabetic, you know, 5.2, 5.3, 5.4, no red flags. And then, so that would have taken us to about uh, 2007, 2008. And then in 2011, I was diagnosed with um, stage one breast cancer, and I went through radiation and surgery and went on tamoxifen, which is a um, hormone estrogen agonist, right, to kind of get rid of the estrogen in my body that would feed a potential, you know, regrowth of the tumor. And within about six months of starting on that, I was due for my annual physical, and I went in and my fasting blood sugar was 163. And, and it had been like under 110 the entire time. And my A1C was like 6.5 or 6.6. .6, so boom, right out of nowhere. And, and my joke with my doctor um, was that, you know, she looked at me and I had just run a half marathon and she, every Sunday morning was in my spinning class that I taught. We belonged to the same gym. And she laughed and looked at me and said, I don't know what to say, diet and exercise <laughs> because <laughs> And, and I, I'm like, I looked at her, I said, you see me in spandex every day, every Sunday, do I look like I need to be on a diet? And she's like, well, you know, I'm going to put you on metformin. Um, I know you're already eating a healthy diet. So, you know, we don't really need to talk about that. And I had been actually already eating pretty low carb because I thought to myself, well, if I do have a chance that I'm going to be pancreatically fun dysfunctional, right? Why would I, why would I challenge my body? And and it frankly was made it easier for me to keep my weight off. I've never been one of those people that was like naturally thin, right? And so 
Um, something about the whole type 2 diabetes diagnosis didn't sit right with me. I had none of the risk factors, none. No family history. We all know there's a very strong genetic component to type 2. Um, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go see an endocrinologist. And I walked into this endocrinologist's office and he took one look at me and said, you're not type 2. And he ran my GAD antibodies, GAD 65, um, handed me a pen of Levomir, told me to start on, you know, 10 units a day. And, and that was it, kind of sent me on my way. And then about, I don't know, maybe a month later, I was realizing that my, and of course, I I'm, I'm, didn't have a, meter, a monitor at that time, I just had a meter, but I was testing a lot because I really wanted to understand what was happening. And I was seeing, you know, after a fairly low carb meal, 180, 190, and I was like, you know, duh, no. So I went back to him, I said, I'd like fast acting insulin for meal times. he gave it to me. And then in the meantime, I had my primary care doctor run all the other antibodies. And my um, islet cell antibodies came back slightly elevated. Positive is positive, right? It doesn't have to be greatly positive. It just has to be positive. So at that point, you know, it was pretty much a, a solid type 1 diagnosis. Um, I did not care for that doctor, so I sought out another endocrinologist that people recommended. And I walked in there, and she looked at me, she's, and she looked at my numbers, and she looked at me, she goes, well, I don't actually think you're diabetic. <laughs> and I went, why? She goes, well, your blood sugars are normal. And I said, they're normal because I'm eating a low-carb diet and I'm taking insulin. And she goes, well, no one can stick to a low-carb diet. Mm -hmm. And so I said, bye-bye. Um, and then about six months later, finally found one who, um, I walked into her office. They, they pricked my finger, took my A1C, looked at my CGM trace, and she walked in the office and she looked at me and said, hi, I, I, it's nice to meet you. I want to know how you do this. And I was like, bingo, found the right doctor. So that was, I've been with her about um, probably six years now. And whenever I see her, she's like, you know, you really don't need me. She goes, your primary care doctor can write your scripts. I can't teach you anything you're not already doing. And I just love her. And, and we have a very respectful relationship. We like to bounce new research that we find off of each other. She gave me her personal email. Um, so we have a really unique relationship. So I go because I like, I like to, right? I don't need to. And my doctor's like my primary care. I don't know anything about pumps. I, you know, I'd feel much better if you kept seeing her. So that's my story in a nutshell. My last A1C was 4.8. I just had a um, retina issue unrelated to diabetes. And the uh, retinologist looked at me and said, I've never seen healthier diabetic eyes. You have no, no sign of um, diabetic eye disease. So I, I, I'm like doing something right. So there it is. <laughs> Thank you for your story. It's interesting. It's the first time I hear it. In fact, I've heard I've heard parts of it, but not I haven't heard it fully before. Right. So I, I heard you at a conference at the um, uh, Bethany McKenzie's conference. Oh, yeah, yeah, one yeah. Of the blue, blue ball. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I didn't know the full full story, uh, Bridget. So I'm going to be the outlier here. Um, I was actually diagnosed as a teen, so a little bit wacky for being in a LADA group um but but you are so stinking smart yes you have such a good perspective and such good people skills that the group would not be the same without you so I'm I'm I'll exclude other people that don't have LADA but I'm not gonna <laughs> exclude you so neither is Paul I appreciate it um I was in that weird bracket and this was I figured it out while we were sitting here 27 years ago um so I'm, I'm the old person in the group, um, which is funny, um, but <laughs> right. Um, it's, it's weird to be in that position of talking to people in their sixties and seventies and be the experienced one. Um, but it's, it's that time of time on insulin and experience with T1, right. That comes in. So, um, but even then I was told I was too old to be a juvenile diabetic, um, my doctor, I was really, really sick. And every time I went to school, I was a teenager at the time. And every time I went to school, I reacted to the building and, and started having difficulty breathing, which is every kid's dream, right? Oh, you want to be allergic to school. Uh, it's not as much fun when you actually live it. And so we went and got into a habit of, I could make it about two hours before they'd have to do a full nebulizer breathing treatment on me, um, depending on the day, epinephrine. And so we kind of went through this process of staggering when I was at school. So I wasn't always missing the same classes. 
Um, and then I finally got to the point where I just physically, my body was done and I stopped going to school. Um, and that started, um, right after Christmas break. So January, and I wasn't diagnosed until May. Um, and Mm. by that point I had been going to my GP's office and they were running labs every week and they would just run what they hadn't run previously. And I don't even know anymore what all they were running us running. Um, but it was the gamut. How old were you when this happened? I was 13 junior high. Um, yeah, so not really that old, but at the time it was very much like when I went to diabetic camp, everybody was like, Oh, they were all diagnosed when they were like three, you know? So I was the old one for diagnosis and, and kind of the outlier now knowing what we know, um, you know, we're seeing adults, we're seeing, I had a geriatric patient that I worked with the other day that was diagnosed in their nineties, you know, we're seeing the gamut, but at the time, the general consensus was, this isn't how this works. Um, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather was diagnosed with type two during all of that. And my dad got out the like American journal of family medicine, giant book that, you know, you can like read the, the flow charts of like, I have this symptom I have, you know, and was reading about what his dad was diagnosed with and then said, Hey, this sounds familiar. Let's have him run a, a blood sugar check on you. And, you know, like we hear all the time, oh, well, you can't be diabetic, right? So we fought him and fought him. And finally we're like, all we're asking, like we're paying for it. It's my arm that's getting stuck. Why won't you do a blood sugar? Um, so they did it. And then they decided that the results were so high, it couldn't possibly be accurate. Mm-hmm. So they told us to, you know, oh, well don't, cause at this point I was losing, I had lost 25 pounds in a month. Um, my parents were trying anything to get food in me cause I didn't want to eat. Um, so we had been, you know, I, I grew up in a ranching family, so meat heavy vegetables, not a lot of cake and cookies and, you know, stuff like that. Um, but at that point it was like anything she wants to eat, we will feed her. So we were a little higher carb that week than normal, but by relative comparison, we were pretty low carb. Um, and they were like, you know, make sure you don't feed her donuts and fruit snacks and come back in a week. Um, which looking back how I wasn't in ICU between those two times, I don't know. Um, so they reran it and then checked it in office because they, the first time they had sent it off and this time they were like, we're going to, we're going to check it here. And they checked it, um, and made us wait for results and then sent us over to the hospital. Um, so I was in, I believe the 800s, 900s range. Um, so it was up there. Um, but they were just in denial, the fact that I could be diabetic. So I know after that, they changed kind of what they knew about diabetes and how diagnosis works. Um, so that was kind of cool to see them go, Hey, anybody can be diabetic. And even whether they acknowledge that, you know, like you could have a T1 in their forties diagnosis, I don't know, but I know they at least started broadening their horizons a little bit. Um, and then that was back when, you know, exchanges were a thing because we were using NPH and R. Um, so it massively changed how we ate as a family um, because, oh, well, you took this insulin at this time of day and you eat here, but you already took the insulin for it. So you have to eat set amounts of carbs and protein. And we lived that way for seven years or so. Um, before I went and got a pump in order to, you know, just college and 20 year old life and um, thinking that would be a little more flexible. And then I've been primarily a pumper for since that, since that time. So I think I've worn all of them, but one that are currently on, maybe not the current production model, but a similar one. So I tend to, to pump shop around a little bit. So, um, and then I guess career wise, how I, how I play into all of this is, um, I'm also a firefighter EMT and an instructor. So I teach, um, medical professionals, usually firemen, but also EMTs, paramedics, um, people in the emergency medicine. Sometimes we get people from the hospital in that mix as well. Um, but I spend, I teach all the things, but a lot of times what I get called in for is, Hey, we're supposed to be doing continuing ed on diabetes. 
We all know to check blood sugars. What else do we need to know? Um, is there other things that, Hey, we're not watching for this and we should be. And so that's a lot of what I teach there. Um, so I speak medical ease some of the time. So between Paul and I, a lot of times when people come in and ask questions of the group, we're able to explain, this is what your doctor's seeing. This is why your doctor's doing what they're doing. Sometimes we agree with them. Sometimes we don't, but, um, I understand that side of it. And so, yeah, there's a reason that you went into the ICU to ER with a 900 blood sugar and they didn't just fill you full insulin, you know, mm -hmm. so we can kind of explain, explain that side a little bit. And then just, you know, having, having lived with the pancreas side, you know, there's things that you pick up that Paul and Sarah and I are able to share that they don't tell you at the doctor's office. Thank you for that, Bridget. It was interesting that they didn't think you were juvenile diabetes. Well, I was diagnosed at five. So I was a classic case of juvenile mm -hmm. diabetes. Actually, they used, they used, they labeled me as juvenile diabetes. I did, don't ever remember it being called type one and two. And I'm going back mm -hmm. to the 1970s. So uh, I was yeah. juvenile diabetes. So you were too old for that, obviously, in their mind, but also too young for the classic type two onset. Yeah. And so I can see how that conf confused them. Um, Paul, what's your story? Okay, well, there's going to be a few things having to do with how the doctors responded. I don't want anybody to misunderstand. The, the lady who saw me was wonderful. I'm a very stubborn person, or so I've been told. I, I don't agree with them, but everybody says I'm <laughs> stubborn. And... Um, I waited way, way too long to go to the doctor. Um, my wife finally basically put down the, you are going because I'm going to drag you by the hand out to the car and drive you there and push you inside the door. And what had happened is I had developed a really bad fungal inf infection in the back of my throat. Well, first of all, I'd lost massive amounts of weight. In one year, I went from 210 pounds to 118. And I'd say half of that was in the last two months. Mm -hmm. So it was just a massive reduction in weight. And I was eating everything in sight. And it, I was not eating healthy. I wanted things with energy. So I mean, three pound bags of peanut M&Ms, um, glazed donut, it, anything I could think to get energy into my body. That craving was intense, were really, really bad. Um, so I went in and luckily the nurse practitioner at the clinic, uh, I lived and worked in a very small agricultural area. So there wasn't major hospitals or medical practices like that. And uh, this was the satellite clinic from the, the hospital uh, an hour away. And uh, luckily she was a diabetic and she understood that high blood sugar is one of the things that causes fungal infections. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thrush in the back of my throat had gotten to the point where it was basically blocking off my airway, which you can imagine that's probably why my wife got all upset with me. And uh, she trotted out the uh, blood glucose meter and uh, Finger stuck me and checked, and it was well over 400, almost 500. And I hadn't eaten since the night before. So this is a fasting blood glucose. Paul, well, how, how old were you? 62. Then? You were 62 then? 62 then. I'm 68 now. So it was six years ago. So I uh, uh, she gave me a prescription for a metformin and told me to go get a blood glucose meter and go onto the ADA website and download, download their diet, diabetic diet. I'm she's unsupported, completely unsupported. This lady's got a receptionist. This is it. This is everything she's got on her team. Um, and, um, I went home, we went to Walmart, got the blood glucose meter and I called her up and I says, uh, doesn't work. It just says, hi. She says, come in now, not, not five minutes from now, come in now. So I came in now and she checked me with her meter. It was well over 700. Mm -hmm. And because uh, the meter that I had won't go higher than 600. 
And she says, yeah, yeah, with your emaciated state, you're not type two. That's that's just, that's not happening. And so she put me on insulin, sliding scale, NPH and R. Uh, so right out of the 1970s, I, I imagine, right, Bridget? <laughs> and um, I went home and just failed miserably trying to manage my blood glucose. Just, I'm an engineer. I'm a designer. Uh, I do experiments to get information to perfect designs. So I don't care what the answer is, as long as the answer is right. And I'm looking at this. I also write uh, encryption codes, data encryption codes. Cryptography is one of my hobbies. And I realized instantly what I was looking at is a chaotic system. And there's nothing you can do about a chaotic system. They are immune to analysis. The only thing you can do with a chaotic system is find out what the stimuluses are and reduce them. Mm -hmm. So I started looking into that and I ran into uh, R.D. Dykeman on the, on the web where he's talking about the legacy he went through from his son. And it, he isn't touted a lot, but he is a PhD in theoretical physics. Uh, there isn't math that this guy does not know. <laughs> it's just it, inconceivable that if, if someone on earth could possibly write an algorithm for managing type well, type 1 diabetes, he, he would be the guy to do it. And um, I, I agreed with him. This chaotic system, it is stochastic. It's not random, okay? But it is immune from analysis. There's It's way too sensitive. I'm getting nerdly. Sorry. You guys have to slap me every once in a while if I do this, okay? Okay. Um, but anyway, the, the short story is, is you can't fight it. The only way you can fight this thing is to rob it of oxygen, is to take away from the gasoline. And the gasoline is starch and sugar. Everybody says carbohydrates, but carbohydrates is a stupid word. It means nothing. It's a chem word in chemistry that has no application to us diabetics. Starch is a carbohydrate. There's many foods that are carbohydrates that have no effect on your blood glucose as there are foods that have high impact on your blood glucose. So we need to talk about the drivers of high blood glucose, which is starch and sugar. So everything he said just rang true. And it was just, I just had goosebumps watching his video. Went out and got Dr. Bernstein's book and perfect sense. And I figured, okay, well, I'm not gullible. I'll try it for 30 days. And if I'm going to try it, I'm going to give it a good try. And I'm going to follow it exactly for 30 days. And uh, I did. Great success. Calm. First time. Not this, what's the, the blood sugar roulette, you know, where your fingers stick yourself and you try and guess what it's going to be. And you have no idea. <laughs> and uh that all went away. I just went instantly to this this smooth line, and uh, and after three months, I went back into the doctor's office, and she sent out for an A1C and called me back and said, "You have to come in right now." And I came back in, and she says, "Your A1C is four point nine. That is way too low. You're going to kill yourself." And I was like. I'm not trying to get a low A1C. I'm trying to be normal. I'm getting, I'm not big getting a low A1C by going low. I'm getting an A1C by mowing down all the high points. And, I'm gonna and, put that, I'm gonna put that statement on the <laughs> screen. So it okay. gets to people's head. I'm not yeah. trying to lower my A1C, I'm trying to be normal. Yeah, so I, that was my beginning. So and I follow, followed Sarah, him to, to, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to jump in and say, I, I think we're all still dealing with that on some level because of the Accord study. And and the Accord study yes. flawed and, dis, and, and discontinued because there were people that were getting sick and dying. Um, the, the entirely wrong conclusions were drawn from that study. And, and it was the people that actually had the higher A1Cs that were dying, and it was the intensive treatment that was causing people to die. 
and yes. because it was a blood it was an a1c lowering effect overall now that low a1c is getting blamed as as yeah. being the cause of of the problems in the study and it will not go away it just like i, I yeah. you want to make it go away but we need to you want to hear an engineer's viewpoint on that they lied <laughs> sorry uh they tested their management protocol with intensive insulin management okay all they tested the only thing that study proved was is that their, their management system along with that was flawed it wasn't one component or the other you can't break the two out you can't get blame out of there so they tried to do it with tons of insulin and we do it with far far less insulin it's a completely different paradigm Okay. System. I was sure. about to say, well, I really loved your stories. And, you know, this is always my favorite part of every episode when I hear people's stories. Um, they all resonate with me as to some level, but they're also very different and exciting. But there is a common theme in there in all of your stories and all of the stories that I hear from my other guests, the misdiagnosis. In this day and age, with all the tools we have, is there an excuse for misdiagnosis? <laughs> I, so, I would like I'm to sure think, have some, yes, Bridget. As a, as a medical professional, and I've seen, I've been licensed for 20 years. Um, I'm, I'm dating myself, but <laughs> um, I think we have made progress as a diabetic community, um, the awareness it's not everywhere. We still have work to do, but I feel like the awareness to the fact that, Hey, they might be type one. What I'm seeing in the people in that I interact with is that they're aware that it exists. They're aware that, Hey, this is a possibility. Um, and we should keep that on our radar. And that's not something when I was diagnosed that was true and probably you too. Um, you know, it used to be, Oh, that's super rare. That can't be it. That's not, sadly, it's not as rare as it used to be. Um, and we could argue back and forth whether it's truly more common or we're catching it more. I don't know that we have that answer, um, but I would like to think we're at least making progress, but we're still hearing those stories. If you get, you know, if you're in our room for any period of time, people, you know, that's all we hear, right? Is, oh, they told me I was type two and they treated me for type two for five years. As a as an emergency medical practitioner, that concerns me. How these people aren't <laughs> ending up in my ambulance and my ER, I don't know. Um, because if you had waited that long for me, I would have been dead. So it's it's amazing that more of them, but I know we're losing some of them because I see it. Um yeah. and if we can prevent that, but I at least think we're we're making progress. There's we're moving the right direction, but very slowly. I, I think there's a couple things at play here. I think, you know, so often the high blood sugar appears at a physical conducted by a primary care physician, right? Mm -hmm. And and they're not a diabetologist. They may have some experience. Um, the reality is that of their patients that have diabetes, it's likely that 90% of them are type two, right? So we're gonna go look for the low hanging fruit here, right? Where's the common thread? and and that especially an older physician who may not have been exposed to this idea that you know someone that comes in there with an already has an autoimmune condition and suddenly presents with diabetes mellitus right how how do you distinguish type one from type two as a, a potentiality there right so um and to me it, it's pretty clear you could still miss some stuff but if you applied just a little bit of critical thinking to what you know about your patient's history and what you know about your patient and a sudden diagnosis of type two doesn't fit, then then some alarm bells should go off in your head. So that doesn't happen. Uh, the other thing that happened is the, the folks at the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation have done us no favors, right? Um, this idea that type one is a juvenile disease, they finally just changed it. What did they change it to? Now it's called something else, type the 1. The ADRF changed into breakthrough, I believe. Something breakthrough. Yeah, it'll break through your wallet. 
Oh, yeah. sorry. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> I heard many variations of it. Actually, I came across many oh. different variations of of of, of that on on social media when they changed their name. But uh, but let's move on. But Sarah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, and, and then I think too that you know the loud voice of the American Diabetes Association. They're much louder than the JDRF. They have a lot more people that they support. Sorry. Um, and, I, and I think because of that, there's also this just prevalence of, of adults have type 2 diabetes. They don't develop type 1 diabetes. And, and, pa and Paul and Bridget can reinforce this as well, that we did an informal poll in our group, and about 66% of the people in our group who now have a LADA diagnosis were initially misdiagnosed as type 2. In yeah. some cases, it was somebody like me that said, hmm, something's not right, and I fought for the right diagnosis. Other people had no idea that something, that that wasn't the right diagnosis, so they let themselves be treated as a type 2 until they either went into DKA, um, lost, had a miscarriage, right, lost a pregnancy. Um, you know, something bad had to happen to sort of trigger the, the right diagnosis then taking place, and we need that to just not happen, ever. And we're a long way from that, unfortunately. Sarah, we're talking about uh, uh, diagnosis and um, misdiagnosis. So let's talk about. Well, can I, can I touch on that real quick? Yeah, let me ask my question, and then okay. uh, I'll give you the stage, uh, uh, Paul, if you don't mind. So, um, because it was, uh, if there are any medical professionals watching this episode, or anyone suspecting they may have diabetes and they haven't been officially diagnosed. What are the important, essential tests that should be done so we can diagnose people correctly? Paul. I can get to the tests, but it won't do a darn thing if nobody ever runs them. Mm. The problem is, is we think we have a disease called diabetes that comes in two types. And that's not true. There are completely different diseases, completely different. It is so easy if you look at the labs to the, tell the difference between one and the other. The problem is the perceptual difference. And the problem is, is that type ones are not being misdiagnosed. Type twos are being misdiagnosed. They're being diagnosed with a disease based upon a test that cannot discriminate type two because all of the blood glucose markers that identify a type 2 are common to an early stage type 1. There is no difference between them. You cannot look at a person in the eye and say, you're a type 2, and you need to buy all these meds and take all these medicines and all these, these drugs and come back in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, and then I'll chew you out because you're noncompliant, because your numbers aren't improving, when they're being treated for the wrong disease because they never test the type twos for the right disease. If they tested a type two, if they could not write a prescription and bill the insurance company until they've screened out type one, all of this misdiagnosis, or excuse me, a great deal of this misdiagnosis will go away because there are no um, uh, red flags. We've seen obese type ones, we've seen skinny type ones, we've seen type ones with this type. I mean, the, the, they run the gamut. Everybody who says, if you suspect type one, that's silly. There's no basis to suspect type one because everything you're looking at is always going to be the same for type two and or type one until they go into DKA. And right. a lot of people don't come back. And even the ones who do come back from that comeback unwhole. They're on dialysis. Their, their life is ruined. That is an inexcusable diagnostic screen for type 1 diabetes. And I'll get off my, <laughs> okay, um, the, the tests. I like to look, everybody says antibody tests, but there are a percentage of type 1s called idiopathic type 1 who <laughs> do not have positive antibodies. Okay, so everybody says, yes, LADA, latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, but we're for all adult diabetes. 
if you don't have antibodies, we aren't going to throw you out of our club. It's not going to happen. Uh, so you need to find the true discriminator, which is that you're not making enough insulin. So you need to have a fasted C-peptide test, and it has to be done right, and it has to be interpreted in the context of the blood glucose at the moment the blood was drawn for the C-peptide. Because otherwise, that has got such a, a range of, 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 of values. So if you've got a C-peptide that's in the quote-unquote normal range, but your blood sugar is 180, guess what? You're not normal. The normal range does not apply to you. You know, these doctors who say, oh, okay, the test came back normal. You're not type 1. That is, it's not if you look at the brochure, the, 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 not brochures, uh, I have a problem connecting words sometimes. So you folks have to forgive me. Uh, um, guidelines? What's that? Uh, in the guidelines? in the text. Yeah, in the guidelines. Um, C-peptide is not diagnostic for type 1. What it does is it tells you whether you're more towards type 1 or type 2. It doesn't tell you whether you're one or the other. That's always context dependent. So yeah, you get the C-peptide, you get the autoimmune because it's nice to know. Um, but if you're not making enough insulin to keep your blood glucose in normal range, you know, if you're a type two and if your blood glucose is 140, your C-peptide should be way off the charts high not low, not normal, not medium. It should be high because a type two has got hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So if they can't get their blood sugar down, by definition, they have high insulin. Uh, we're the exact opposite. Like I said, the, the reason for the misdiagnosis is so heartbreaking because most doctors don't even know what causes type two. They don't know that a type 2 presents with super high insulin. I, I was talking to the phlebotomist, and you guys, I'll shut up in a minute. Um, I was talking to the phlebotomist at the lab who did my blood draws, and I said, how often do you get a fasted C-peptide test ordered? She says, almost never. They don't look. What do you do? You know, uh, uh, this is why... I'm in love with the doctors who get it, who are trying, who want to learn, who want to ask instead of tell us what to do. We know a hell of a lot more about doing this than they do if they just ask us, but they won't. Uh, they want to tell us their knowledge. So get off my high horse here, but it's, I get emotional about it. Um, and apologies in advance. So. I do too. I mean, you know, it's so heartbreaking in our group to see how frustrated so many people are when they know that they've been misdiagnosed and they can't get a doctor to run the test yeah. that you run, or the doctor runs one antibody and says, well, you're, you're negative, or, you know, yeah. doesn't know how to interpret the C-peptide. Um, and, and it's really not rocket science, and, and it's, it's disturbing. Um, it's also disturbing to me that when presented with a patient who has clearly done their research and walks in there with a list of the tests that need to be taken because we have it in our files um and and they refuse yes and it's like well i'm paying for it. why are you refusing and and we've come to the point now where we say to our members you when this happens to you you say to the doctor i would like you to note it in my chart that i asked for this test and you refused right because at some point, if this person ends up in a dire situation, you're going to point back to that and go, I asked for these tests. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I think as, as a society, we're becoming better consumers of healthcare and, and better at standing up for what we want. But we find ourselves in our group coaching a lot of people to have to really be, to really self-advocate. And, and it's uncomfortable for some people, especially I find older women in particular. Um, very uncomfortable for them to stand up to, you know, God, I mean, the doctor. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I think that's a, a big thing with type one. Um, I was fortunate in when I was diagnosed that they 
they taught this is this is your disease and you are running the boat but what we see is we don't see that being taught anymore yes um it's it's very well call me and we'll adjust your insulin well maybe for the first month or two while you're trying to figure it out sure but your office should be working you to let's teach you how to adjust your own insulin let's teach you what to watch for because if you can't self adjust this is a daily, sometimes weekly. I know I personally adjust my basal rates, which is would be my long acting if I was on long acting. Um, I have like three or four that I process through the month because of hormones, right? I have a different one from when I'm at work than when I'm at home. If I had to call my doctor's office and figure all that out, it would it would be wacky. I would have maybe a month, a week that we hit it, and the rest of the time it would be off, right? Um. We, we can't, you have to advocate for yourself and the people that are, str- you know, getting good A1Cs and it's, it's a combination of diet, but it's also taking the bull by the horns and saying, I'm not going to take this laying down. I'm not going to just do whatever. And, and, oh, it's a big deal. It's, you have to accept that, no, I'm in control and I have got to take this back because if you just passively sit by, it doesn't, it doesn't end well. It doesn't work well for you. Um, it's not a, oh, take one of these a day and right. you'll be fine kind of disease. Yeah. And we're seeing more of that. And I think it's both sides. I think it's the medical professional that doesn't understand what this looks like, especially in adults. Um, I see a lot of geriatrics and, and the prevalent if you think T1 management is scary, go go hang out with the geriatrics and it's abysmal. Um, I have patients that I wish they had a sliding scale. It's it's bad. Um, but the general consensus is, oh, well, they're 80. Oh, they're 90. It doesn't matter because they won't live long enough to see the complications. And that's never something that as a provider, that's not my place. Um, my job is to fight for the best care of my patient and whether that's the next three hours or the next 30 years, it doesn't matter. That's our job as professionals and, and the medical community. And we're starting to see some of that shift, but it makes some of our old practitioners uncomfortable. Um, and so if you're not getting that care from your office, find a new office um, because you should be. But that's what we see all the time is, you know, oh, well, they were happy with it cool but it's not their life right they're happy that your a1c went from nine to seven because it's not we like we like to tell people it's not their feet right it's not their toes that are going to disappear so they don't care they won't feel a thing um just just to add one little thing oh sir that's not me that's sarah (laughs) no go ahead um the doctors don't manage these patients expectations the patients walk out of that office thinking that from now until the end of my life, I'm going to be injecting 15 units of, of Lantus every day. They don't understand that the dose is going to change, that the dose is going to respond to environmental factors and emotional factors and many, many, many other things. So that expectation isn't managed. They come onto our site and they say, oh, my Lantus has stopped working. And I go, well, that's highly unlikely. Um, trust me, <laughs> you know, if you take twice as much, did you probably freeze it or put it in the sun? <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, they don't manage their expectations. They don't let them know what's in store for them. So when they do run into that, they're all freaked and panicked. And okay, and I'm realistically, sorry. we're we're the only disease that is that way, right? Yes. If If you have a cardiac disease, right, we're going to monitor you. We're going to try this med. Oh, this med works. Cool. We have figured out. We fine tuned your dose. This is now what you take until it doesn't work. But that may be years, if ever, that we have to adjust that. Type one is weird in the fact that we are making those decisions hour by hour. And if we get it wrong, there's consequences, both long-term and short-term, depending on what way we get it wrong. But I think as a society we don't understand that and we like Paul said have not done a good job of educating which is also hard because you know day one is probably not the time 
to have that conversation either. You know, you're in this, oh my goodness, you know, and your brain is all fried from high blood sugar anyhow. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's definitely something that we have missed the boat on as well. I always say copper type one uh, management comes down to two things. One is the input and diet is part of the input. There are other inputs, of course, being stress, your stress levels, your sleep quality, etc. And second, smart use of insulin, not bold. <laughs> yes. And I know bold. what I'm yes. saying here. I use yes. the word bold intentionally. We got it. Thoughts yeah. on that. You don't we have know. to be well in insulin. You have to be, because it's a potent drug and we can't under, underestimate its, its potency, right? Because it's lethal. You, yeah. Exactly. And so you have to be smart with the way you use your insulin. I mean, if you, if you think about it in these terms, that insulin is the world's most expensive lethal substance, mm-hmm. I mean... It, it, what is it like the sixth most expensive liquid in the world or something like that? But I don't know. Mercury is mercury more expensive. That's also lethal. So I could be wrong. But right, but, ricin's pretty but, pricey. What was that? <laughs> but you can make that pricey. one at home. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, and that's and that's the reality, right, guys? Is is that you know we we live in a I don't want to call it a society, but we're we're in this medical realm of this notion that we have this wonderful drug, this wonderful liquid that will allow us to eat anything we want. Okay. That's the way it's served up. Yeah. And, and that's what's being encouraged by people and, and podcasts or whatever you want to call it that are encouraging parents to be bold with that lethal drug, be bold with it. You notice they don't tell the type twos that? Mm-mm. Nope. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. It, starting insulin as a type two is palliative care. It's what they do when they want to ease your passing. Uh, when yeah. nothing else works. Yeah. Yeah. That that is something that I think all three of us were also um in a pediatric group. Um, and yeah. we see a night and day difference between, you know, um, low carb has become more popular, right? And thankfully both worlds, but the, the patients that are coming from type two to type one treatment, right? Obviously they were type one the whole time, but, um, their doctors are a little more, you're a grown adult. You can make your own choices. And we have seen that, that low carb helps these patients. And so, yeah, now we're adding insulin, but it doesn't make sense to have bunt cake every day for breakfast. (laughs) Our pediatric patients they're being told things like, if you don't feed your child ice cream every night, they're going to not make it. They're going to die in their sleep. Yeah. Um, well, it, there's a there's disconnect. Another layer to that too, though, which is this idea that there's somehow ice cream and, and as you know, RD likes to say, cake pie um, <laughs> is the key to a happy childhood, right? Yeah. And this notion yeah. that your child is going to feel different and, and, and all of the, the really strange scare tactics that doctors give these, these parents, well, you don't want your child to feel different. You don't want your child to feel left out. You don't want your child to develop an eating disorder. Meanwhile, the parents are so addicted to carbohydrates and so are the children that nobody's even talking about the fact that they already have an eating disorder. So we don't want to ch- exchange an eating disorder for another eating disorder. So let them eat whatever they want and cover it with insulin. We don't want them to feel different. And, and this, this like drumbeat of, oh my gosh, my child is going to feel different. You know what? I, I, I just patently reject all of those notions that childhood has to do with food, that, that uh, happiness has to do with, with sweets, that, you know, fitting in has to do with what you eat. I, and, and I don't understand where this like need for conformity comes from. Yeah. I think some of it is social media. I think some of it is kids feel more pressure today to be like every other kid. And yet these these teens and children that we see that are thriving using low carb are different from other kids. You know what they are? They're better students. They're more driven. They're, they're better at sports. Yeah, they're different. They're different in a really good way because they've learned that 
what they have and what they can do is special. They're captains of their own ships. And it's powerful to watch. And there's a lot of great examples of it out there. But equally powerful is that lobby of, of the reverse of that, which is I don't want my child to feel different. I don't want to deprive her yeah. of the blizzard and, and this giant piece of cake with eight scoops of ice cream. How much insulin should I bolus for this is the question. Yeah. Not should I feed that to any child. Without killing you. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just... without causing hypoglycemia, but talking mm -hmm. of the potency of insulin, in fact, it, you know, um, I mean, you're all from the United States and it's easy to walk into Walmart. And I've had that message like comment in my Facebook groups, people from the United States telling my members who are from all over the world, they just yeah. walk into Walmart and buy your insulin in the UK, for example. Yep. You cannot walk into a pharmacy and buy insulin. You must have a prescription. And good luck. That's, a, that's a whole nother you, issue you um, could have. So, could line so you it is something. treated yeah. as a potent drug. You cannot go and buy insulin of your choice. And good Sweet. luck to you if you actually want to, you know, if you want to convince yep. your diabetologist to write you a prescription for our insulin, for example. Yep. Sweden. Um, and so it's Britain. easy, you know, yeah. for some people to say, hey, you need, you have to have that. I'll go and buy it. It's it's not the case yeah. in some countries. I fought for it. I've given up. I've yeah. given up fighting for it because I had to write and, uh, uh, st uh, you know, an essay and stand in front of a tribunal. I thought, you know what? All for our insulin. I'm managing. I'm doing an okay job with my pump. I'm happy with it. In Canada now, I'm in Toronto. I walked into the pharmacy and I bought our insulin for the very first time. Mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, how easy is this? And, you know, now I have to figure out how to use it, of course, because that takes adjustment. And uh, and I went back to my to my pump. I thought, you know what? It took me years to work out how to use my pump to cover my protein. Right. Now I have to start all over again. However, I'm not the only one. There are many, many people who rely entirely. At, and this is the UK. I'm not even talking about other parts of the world. Yeah. In the UK, right? You cannot get insulin unless your consultant gives you a prescription. Can't so, get a C peptide. I just wanted to throw it out there, whether it was relevant to the conversation, but I just wanted people to to know because I haven't really talked about this much. So yeah. No, which, a, which okay, that's... so it's it's a powerful drug and you may not be able to get a hold of it, right? So why use more than you need to, right? If I only get, and I don't know about you guys, but my insurance is very persnickety about how much I'm allowed to have a month. Cool. I would rather save that cushion that I have for, in my world, right? Every time I do CPR on somebody, my blood sugar spikes. You would think eventually I would get used to that. So far, it hasn't happened. So I, I can cut down the noise here and use a smaller amount so that I have that backup for, oh, we did more CPR this month than normal, which isn't something I can control, then I have that cushion before I'm sitting at the pharmacy going, hey, I know it's only been 20 days, but I don't have insulin if we don't fill it today. I don't want to put myself, it goes back to that control, right? I don't want to put myself in that spot if I don't have to. Stuff happens, but I've learned some tricks over the years, right? Like vial safes and things like that, that I can try to Make sure I don't run out when I'm not supposed to. Um, but, you know, we we recognize that, you know, even your insurance company recognizes you can only have this much, right? And 100%, it is something that is so strong that we, I I would love them to say, you know, you can, you can, you can take as much insulin as you need, right? Like you can eat whatever you want to, but they need to tack on and say, but there are consequences, yeah. right? There are consequences whether you're diabetic or not, right? If you're living on Pop-Tarts and cake and ice cream, whether you're a type one or not, there is consequences for those choices. And we, I'm going to speak to the United States because that's where I'm at most of the time, but we have forgot that. We seem to think that all food is equal and all food is good and everything you're eating, that's a good thing. The, Which, it's, on the flip it, side, it is, but. And it, it, it's a probability thing, too. Like, you can, we get people on, on the on the site all the time who say, well, I do this all the time, and it works. What, 50 times? 
70 times, 100 times? How many times out of 100 uh, is dying okay? You know, it's it's like, I'm sorry, this isn't a casino. You know, it, uh, no cocktail waitress is going to bring you a free drink if you sit there. Um, but it, but it know, kind of is because they're playing Russian roulette yeah. with their insulin dosage. Yeah. And at some point, right, whether whether they make it, you know, I, I love the EMS system. I'm very passionate about it. If you want to hear my soapbox there, we can bring it out later. But um, I can't guarantee that my brothers and sisters that work in EMS with me can be there in time to get you dextrose, to get you glucagon, to get, and sometimes even when we do, it, it's not soon enough. It's not enough. Um, I can't guarantee that. And so why, why take that chance, right? That's your backup plan that you hope to never need. Don't rely on that as the, well, if something goes wrong and I guess wrong, cause I decided to eat an entire cake by myself, I'm sure the ambulance down the street will fix it. Yeah. I do wonder if, uh, you know, if this is where that fear factor comes from, your diabetologist is afraid or worried if they see like, in Paul's case, uh, A1C, that's 4.9, because in their mind, that's only possible when you are using massive amounts of insulin, mm -hmm. with which, of course, comes with a high risk of uh, dangerous um, the seizures, right, or hypoglycemic events. Not I think to mention this, the is, this is the common understanding. They, I don't think they genuinely understand, and they, they refuse to understand or to learn that yeah. there are better ways of achieving normal A1Cs without having to use massive doses of insulin. But, but see, here's the part that I don't get is that the doctors that are telling parents to let their kids eat whatever they want and cover it with insulin have to know that that requires large doses of insulin, right? And those same doctors are looking at that CGM trace and seeing the roller coaster. I mean, all of the evidence is literally there for them to, to interpret with a little bit of critical thinking. Hmm, okay, let's see. This child's not meeting his A1C goals. Um, in the last month, he had, you know, 10 or 15% below range hypos, you know, whether they're very low or just low, and another 15% very high, and he was only... 60% in range, and that range, by the way, goes up to 180. Don't even get me started on that, right? And and yet, at what point does that clinician say, you know what, maybe we need to look at the food that's being fed because these large doses of insulin and large amounts of carbs are causing stress. They're causing the numbers to not be where they should be. And there is nothing that's a normal childhood about that, okay? Getting pulled out of class to go in the nurse's office because you're hypo. Having to sit out gym class because you're low. I mean, I literally had to sit out Orange Theory the other night because I didn't miscalculate something. I just didn't, I forgot to tell my pump that I had exercised and I should have reduced my basal and I didn't. And I got to Orange Theory, which is like a workout class. And I got there and I was 70 with a sideways down arrow. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I have to leave. I can't. This is not going to come up in time for me to do this workout. And I thought to myself, this is happening to children in school every single day. First time it's happened to me in 12 years. Okay. What about that as a normal childhood? You want your child to feel normal? Don't get him pulled out of class to go get an injection. Don't have him like passing out in gym class. That's normal, right? What he eat has, eats has nothing to do with being normal. This, this is not normal, right? So... I look at these doctors who not only have the CGM trace and are asking questions about diet and all these other things and wondering where the critical thinking skills went that prevent them from being able to figure that out. I, it, it boggles my mind and it infuriates me, to be perfectly honest. You guys know I like to get off on my high horse. There it was. We, we all have soapboxes. That's why we all work well together. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think part of it too is that they have been taught this is what's expected, right? It's not the question. People are going to ask questions if your diabetic took too much insulin and died because their blood sugar was 20. They don't get asked questions of why their diabetic lost their feet and became blind 
and slowly die a painful death. Nobody because asks those questions. Diabetes, but that's because just, that's normal, right? And and they don't tell these parents either that by the time their child is twenty two, they're going to be on dialysis, right? They're going to be getting eye bleeds. They're all of these things. They there's no fear factor put into that other than the fear of a hypo. That is the only fear. Or the fear of not having a cupcake. Yeah. That's right. it. Yeah. Well, well that's but, but a lot of this is we all know we can eat the cupcake. It's just a different cupcake. A lot right. of this is collateral damage. We're getting the the side spray from the large processed food manufacturers who are very artfully processing these manage messages that foods are food and everything in moderation, blah, blah, blah. They're doing damage control for their brands and we're getting the backscatter from it. And Paul, I think that's something else that we need to talk about is literally this, this push from big grain and big food um, and how the American Diabetes Association is so deeply in the pocket of big food and big pharma. And they're the organization that's supposed to be looking out for the majority of people with diabetes. Um, and we know that we, we can, I could probably put links up on the screen right now to a bunch of, of information that, you know, basically proves out that it's pay for play with the American Diabetes Association, former employees. You don't believe we're supposed to have oatmeal for breakfast? <laughs> uh, only if you have peanut butter with it, Bridget, because the peanut butter. <laughs> Slows down the bananas that you're adding to, <laughs> right? And in the right order, because if you eat yes, the yes, first, yes. and then the banana, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, you guys know my story with that when I had gestational diabetes. You know, I was a really healthy eater, and I was like, I don't know how to eat for this. Like back then, they didn't give you a monitor, they didn't give you a meter. You went they in, still don't. You went in once a week and got a blood draw, and I'm like, what is that telling you? That's like nothing. It's like yeah. my, my point in time blood sugar on a Tuesday morning when all I've had is coffee is irrelevant to what's been happening in my placenta the rest of the time, right? <laughs> and so the, I said, you know, could I go see a dietitian to like learn how to eat for this beast, right? And I walk in this woman's borderline morbidly obese and tells me to eat for breakfast oatmeal with a banana for lunch, um, whole wheat bread and something lean turkey, you know, um, I could snack on a small apple, small apple, um, and then dinner, you know, protein and, and, you know, some brown rice or whole wheat pasta and, and all of this. I'm like, wow, okay, that doesn't really seem like it makes sense. So my husband goes out and he was in the medical field at the time and gets me an actual meter. And I start testing after these foods that she's telling me to eat. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm 250 after yeah. breakfast, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's when, why when I was diagnosed with diabetes, I was like, okay, I know what I'm not doing, right? I knew what I was not doing. And that was, I was not following the ADA diet. And that led me to, I don't know how I found type one grit or whatever, but um, yeah, it's, the system's broken, guys. It's well, really- Part of, part I of have the to problem- this warning. I had to put this warning out, I'm sorry, Paul, but you know, anyone watching mm -hmm. this, please do not follow the dietary guidelines of the American diabetes. <laughs> do not follow them. I mean, a fruit salad, one of the ones that that really infuriated me was, you know, high sugar fruits. Yeah. Came berries, which are relatively lower in sugar, but high sugar like sweet fruits yes. and peaches. two peaches. teaspoons of sugar yeah. added to it. Yeah. Extra sweetness. Apparently, strawberries aren't sweet enough. We needed to help them out. Yes. Yeah. It's crazy. Anyway, so for anyone watching this, please do not follow their um uh, diet plans. <laughs> Paul, I'm going to quote you now because this uh -oh. is in your paper <laughs> and it's just, it fits in perfectly to what we've been discussing. So uh, Paul has written a white paper and he kind of shared it with me. It, it's a great read. You touch on everything, which, you know, we're discussing now, but this is, I like this one. Without sane management, injected insulin becomes a recreational drug, easily abused by both patient and physician. Wow. Calls him like a season. <laughs> I mean, if you think about that, guys, like 
Think about the way a lot of Americans eat. And people, you'll hear people say, I'm an emotional eater. Mm -hmm. I'm rewarding myself with food, right? There's drug abuse right there, okay? Food as a drug. What's that expression? Um, food is the most overrated, um, addictive, the most common addictive drug in America and exercise is the least used antidepressant, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that balance of I'm using food to make me feel better and, and I'm when I could be using exercise to make me feel better, right? So you're already abusing a drug, which is food, and now you're adding another drug that you can that can help you abuse it. It's an it's an enabler drug, right? Gateway. It's a gateway drug. Maybe that's what I'm looking for. I don't know, but as as, as a society, we have not acknowledged that you know there's acceptable addictions, right? And there's unacceptable addictions, and I think that's true of every country. They may change a little bit, but as a global society, we have not acknowledged that food is an addiction, right? Or we have acknowledged, oh, well, some people have problems with food, but they're 700 pounds, right? Right, right. I right. don't have a problem with food. And we, we lie to our, you know, it's like caffeine, right? And I say that as I am drinking large amounts of caffeine over here, because caffeine makes my personality most of the time. Hi. Um, Hi. <laughs> first, um, first responder life, there's a lot of caffeine. Um, Say hi. Hello. Hey. My granddaughter. Is it your granddaughter? Oh, Hello. Oh, Ellen. Is your skin. granddaughter? That's Nayiri. That's Bridget. And uh, forget this lady's name. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> okay, you got to go now. But, but I think we, we don't go acknowledge that at all, right? We don't acknowledge caffeine as an addictive source, maybe a little bit, but we completely ignore that food is addictive. And if we did right then we'd all have to have hard conversations that as a society we don't we don't want to we want to think everybody else has problems but we don't um, but let's, let's rephrase that though do you, do you know anyone that's addicted to protein like steak <laughs> i mean i'd like to be <laughs> okay. the, i'm the addicted to ribeyes i know i i'm right there with you like that i all i crave anymore is like meat and protein and which is I'm <laughs> totally fine with but but the endorphin rush that comes from the glucose rush and the insulin rush that comes from eating carbohydrates is completely different than yeah. anything any satiety that you get from protein and fat and well, and that's the problem and it's compounded because the more you're exposed to it the more those receptors down regulate and the more you have to have it's just like any other yeah. addictive drug um yeah. And, there, and they, there's a there's progression. Studies, there's studies that prove, right, that your brain lights up when you have carbohydrates, you have grains, yeah. um, you have starches, and that they're seeing those receptors in your brain that are similar to, you know, when we give, I think it's cocaine. Um, it's a fairly significant, it's either that or meth, um, that we're seeing the same brain activity, yeah. right? But that's where it stops. They don't ever push that science any further than that. They don't ever go, oh, and so therefore you shouldn't eat this, 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 right? Right. We should we should reevaluate what we're eating because it's like cocaine. We don't we don't go there because well Kellogg's and I say that as somebody who lives by Kellogg's plant, Kellogg's pays good money for their advertising slots, and we don't want to make them mad because it's big business, you know. And the more. We can sell the food, but then also the more we can sell, if we get you to use more insulin, well, that's, that's expensive. You know, it's, that's we don't want to fix the problem. We just want to cover it up. I, I was, I was addicted to nicotine for all my adult life. And I was one of those people who could not moderate. I mean, I would go for the biggest, stinkiest, nastiest cigars you could think of and inhale them, you know, yeah. um, finally ended up I just couldn't handle it anymore and, and changed but I have nothing uh, you know I don't say any of this with a sense of smug superiority you know uh, yeah. I, I'm i sure 90% of the people out there haven't done anything as bad as all the things I've done yeah um, there's no no judgment here you know we're, yeah. we're all in this boat to reiterate what you were saying, uh, Bridget, uh, in fact, uh, it's the cover photo in Dr. Joan Ifland. I've interviewed her uh, talking about addictions. It's mm -hmm. in her Facebook 
Facebook group, the brain scans of three yeah. groups of people. So the most damaged uh, brains were the brains of um, sugar addicts. So it was spe specifically sugar. So that kind of excludes the protein that you were refer mm -hmm. referring well, to. I, the other part of this too, is I see a lot of articles about sugar addiction, sugar addiction, sugar addiction, and they're talking about cutting back on sugar and, and eliminating sugar. And they're completely leaving out the starches. Yes. Right? Which have the exact same response, albeit maybe, you know, slower, depending on the, the what the form of starch, right? But the the end result is the same. It triggers the same dopamine and serotonin response that that sugar does just a little bit more slowly. It's not as quick of a, you know, it's like the difference between, you know, snorting your Coke and smoking your Coke, I guess. I, it's just, you know. In a piece of pound cake, there's more glucose derived from the starch than there is from, from the sugar in it. Yeah. Well, actually, the science of food addiction is evolving, definitely, because, uh, you know, in my recent nutrition training, we covered it extensively. It was like, come on, am, am I going to learn about ketogenic diets <laughs> here? Or am I going to learn about food addiction was a massive component of the training itself. Um, so it's good that we're now talking more about it. And yes, the starches are included alongside. Good. Chef. Good. Um, in a recent post from one of your group members, someone was talking about the anxiety aspect of managing diabetes, I guess. But um, this person was also saying, mentioned something like, and it's painful for me to say it, but, you know, self-blame. I can't stop blaming myself. Yeah. Could I have prevented this diagnosis? Have I done something wrong? Have I read, led, have I eaten the wrong foods? And so let's talk about that more and then maybe uh, move to what we now know as double diabetes. Kind of, it kind of fits in. I think some of that is bleed over from Thanks, as a you. medical community. Yep. As a medical community, what are we taught about? We're taught about type two because there's far more of them, right? That whole, this is what you're probably going to see more often. Um, disease of gluttony and, and there's there's it used to be that oh well all type twos cause their own type two yeah um we see some of that right like i think all of us including the type twos can agree that yes that is um but i i would question whether that's completely there's there's something that's setting them up um we see it's genetic in some families right there's something else at play yeah. Um, we can manage it a lot of times with some wise choices and some food choices and um, we can help their bodies to better use what they have. Um, but as a medical community, we're very quick to judge and say, oh, well, you caused this to yourself, right? Um, we see it with, with our drug addicts. We see it with our our type twos. We see it with some some other conditions that, oh, well, this was your choice. Um, and you you chose this, this is now the repercussions of it. And I think because we haven't had a lot of training on, hey, there's multiple kinds of diabetes and we call them all diabetes, but they are not the same. And then some of them aren't even related to each other. Um, there's some bleed over because everything they know about diabetes is, oh, well, it's, it's you ate too much food and you caused this. Yeah. And I think as a society, that's what people know about diabetes, right? The number of times I know I, and I'm assuming the other two of you or three of you have as well, that people are like, well, you don't look diabetic. I have, yeah. All the time. What am I supposed to look like? You know, was I supposed to turn blue? Was it, you know? <laughs> well, my daughter I, is, is type two and my wife is type two. And I keep telling them over and over and over again, you know, your, your weight did not cause type two. Type two caused your weight. You know, yes, there were food choices early on or whatever, but when your insulin is high, you can't burn fat. And if you can't burn fat, but you can still eat it, you're going to get big. And it has nothing to do, the, the, the type two did not cause that. I mean, I'm the, 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 the person hyper, hyper insulinemia, the uh, insulin resistance caused that and the weight gain. So they look at, big people and they think you're self-indulgent and of and course they, there are the skinny fat people um uh, yeah. 
like skinny people with maybe slightly bigger belly. Most, Asi most Asians. And they're, yes, I was about to say. So yeah. uh, they don't, they're, they're not obese. Well, and you can have one person, I, I mean, I've seen this in my own life, you know, somebody that's a, a larger person and, you know, maybe doesn't necessarily always eat the best they can. And they can go through their whole life and never have an A1C over like five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they're just not, they're not creating that, that hyperinsulinemic response. Something in their system is allowing that to not happen. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that's, that's fabulous. Um, I think one of the other things that we should talk about, though, is that when when you see these people coming into the group and they are wondering if they did something wrong, um, there there's been a very poor job somewhere in that that whole process of being diagnosed of of having it explained to them that you know that this is an immune system misfire, right? Um, very often they already have uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And the doctor doesn't say to them, well, this is not surprising, right? You have a family history of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, whatever, and they present now with type 1. And, and it's not explained to them that this is not to be unexpected in a family where there's a tremendous history of, type, of, of autoimmune diseases. The other thing that happens is that they, they come in and the only thing they know about diabetes is type 2, right? Or worse case scenario they're told by their doctor that well you have type 1.5 <laughs> it's something that's sort of a combination of type 1 and type 2 no no it is not okay yeah. you might now also have insulin resistance because perhaps you are overweight or you have high triglycerides and hyperinsulinemia from something else pcos right very very common cause of hyperinsulinemia um you've been eating like a standard American diet and covering it with insulin. Now, yes, you have double diabetes. That's what you were talking about earlier was like, how do we get into that topic? But they are distinct conditions. And, and I think, you know, we see less of the, um, was this something I brought on myself than you might think? And it tends to be those people who have been told that this is something between type one and type two. I think yeah. that's part of the problem. Yeah. So yeah, what do you do with the 1.5 labeling? Time to remove it, right? <laughs> so we have it in the name of our group, AKA type yes. 1.5 quotes, because we want people to be able to find us. Mm. If they've been told they have 1.5, right? And, and we, whenever somebody says that, we immediately, like one of us will be like, no, it's type 1, <laughs> right? And we, and we do acknowledge that there is such a thing as double diabetes, um, but, but there's not some a disease that's some hybrid of those two things it doesn't exist right i actually i would love to put forward not that anyone would <laughs> hear my suggestions of even changing type one and type two yes and label yes. into something more appropriate like autoimmune diabetes and maybe insulin resist diabetes of insulin resistance or or something mm -hmm. along those lines there's, there's a guy in our group that has written a paper on that very topic um, and and talking about how the you know, naming them is part of the problem. He's a pretty smart guy, too. It, it would make things so much easier if there was a technical name for the cause of these conditions rather than the symptoms of these conditions. Diabetes means your urine sweet. OK, that's not real helpful. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. It's thousands of years old. That name is thousands, long before lab values. Um, yeah. And not to mention the move now to label Alzheimer's as type three diabetes. Right. No, please. That's enough. One and two yes. are more than enough already. Yes. Maybe it's something else. Alzheimer's is good enough. Stop calling it type three diabetes. So, and, and you had asked earlier about the, the test for um, type one. Do you want to make sure we cover that real quick? Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. Um, so for anybody that needs that information, um, if they will, if they have latent autoimmune diabetes, AKA type 1.5, and they would like to join our group in order to join the group, you request to join and you must answer all the questions. Otherwise we would have a group full of spammers and trolls and we work really, really hard to keep them out. So, um, if you do decide to join, make sure that you check all those boxes, answer all the questions. 
Um, in the files in the group, there is a document that lists all of the tests that are required, starting with C-peptide, which is the one that Paul mentioned first earlier. Um, the second is GAD antibodies, GADA or anti-GAD or GAD65, I believe it's also called. The second is insulin autoantibodies, which is IAA. Um, Insulinoma associated to autoantibodies, which is IA-2, I think that's 2A, thank you. Um, then islet cell cytoplasmic autoantibodies, ICA, which is the one that I actually ended up being positive for. And then the newest one is zinc transporter 8, ZNT8AB. Um, that's the newest one. So that's six tests total. Um, you'll notice none of those are um, A1C or blood sugar, right? So um, these are the tests that will distinguish or help distinguish type one from type two, um, and even from MODI, which is another whole um, conversation right there, but uh, that we don't have time to go into now. But um, so those, those are all in the group in the files section, and those are the ones that you wanna ask your doctor to run. And again, if your doctor won't run them, just make sure that you ask to have it noted in your chart that the doctor refused to run these tests. Very quick question. And, um, um, you know, we'll wrap it up. Um, we only have a few minutes left. DKA, obviously people rightfully, I mean, uh, worry about it, right? But they confuse it with nutritional ketosis. So if I'm not eating carbs and I'm eating a keto diet, which you don't have to, by the way, but if you are and you're seeing a positive sort of impact in your blood sugars, a was is coming down, you're feeling good because you're on a ketogenic diet and it doesn't have to be the super high fat one, but whichever version of the keto diet you do, by the way, even, uh, even um, moderately low carbohydrate diet can result in some ketones in the urine, right? Or even in the blood. Yep. Fasting. Tell me about it because they think now I'm going into DKA. Yeah. And, and this, we could do a whole show just on this, honestly. <laughs> um, I, I find the fear mongering much worse in the children's groups, the parents' groups, where they have the children are the, the, di the person with diabetes. Um, and, and there it's, you know, they've been diagnosed in DKA more often than not, right? And now these parents are terrified of going through DKA again. That's a week long hospitalization. Your child's on his deathbed. Um, and I really want to avoid that. So the second they see a ketone or hear the word ketosis, they naturally go into panic because it's never been properly explained to them that babies are born in ketosis. Breastfed babies are usually in ketosis. Most people wake up in the morning in ketosis if they haven't, unless they ate something right before they went to bed. It's a very natural state. It's a protective state. It protects your brain if you have a hypoglycemic event, right? None of that is explained to them. Um, we see less DKA in our group because of the slower onset of, of LADA. People tend to start out with some beta cells and more often than not, at some point they get diagnosed and get treated properly before they go into DKA, but it does happen. It has happened. We have a number of people that have been in DKA. So we're constantly finding ourselves in a situation of having to explain all of those things. Um, I think if you haven't done a show on the difference between ketosis and ketoacidosis, you could get probably three or four really smart people to come talk about that. I think it's super important. I've, I've covered it in two episodes before with uh, Dr. Ian Lake as well, who's another uh, type one diabetic GP from the UK who actually spearheaded um, five day fasted run for a group of people, two of them were type one diabetics, fasted for five days, and they yep. compared their results results with the non diabetics, and you couldn't tell the difference. You could not tell the difference, and I'm talking about um, detailed tests. They don't. They don't tell people the most uh, important thing that DKA is not caused by ketones. Yes. DKA is not caused by glucose. DKA is caused by insulin starvation. Okay. What happens is, is when your insulin goes below a certain weight level, you can no longer hold the fat in your fat cells and you start liberating free fatty acids into the bloodstream. And these are toxic and the body has to mitigate it. So the only thing the body can do is break it down and turn them into ketones. 
and it's trying to save your life. It's the only thing that keeps you alive long enough to make it to the emergency room. Yeah. This whole connection of ketones with DKA is so backwards. It's, it's just crazy. Um, off the soapbox. I love that rant. Shall <laughs> okay. we, shall we end, end with that? Oh, Unless anyone yeah. has something else to add. Oh, we could do this for hours. Oh my God, yeah. We <laughs> we'll have to do it again. Why don't we do it again? We'll have to do part two. Yeah, yeah I mean, okay. we could get a little more granular about some things too, which would be kind of fun, including ketones and including, you know, what is a well-formulated low-carb diet for someone with diabetes? What, you know, where's the threshold? Does it have to be 30 grams of carbs a day? I say no. I say, you know, if you're eating less than half of what the standard American diet lets you eat, then you're still ahead of the game, right? You might not end up with that beautiful flat line that you can get doing Bernstein, but you're probably going to avoid amputation. You're probably going to avoid blindness, right? So, you know, we kind of take the all or nothing approach because I think for people that are carb addicted, anything more than 30 is going to let that addiction kick back in. Anything more than 30, you're going to be eating fast acting carbs. You're going to be eating sugar. You're going to be eating things that could trigger a problem. But is there an opportunity to get people to start thinking about a therapeutic carbohydrate restriction? It's the all or nothing. Yes, you'll get 10% of them. You'll lose 90%. Who, who wants to and, do and that? And there's a I'm going to throw up the EMS slide on that is which, cause we talked to people and they're like, Oh, I tried low carb and then I had massive problems with my blood sugar. Yeah. Cause mm. your insulin was here. You cut all the carbs out and now you didn't very low and you didn't change your basal. And so like mine cut by half would we switch to low carb and we weren't crazy carb before. Um, right. but I, I dropped my insulin consumption by half. So oh, if you don't plan for that, I take so little insulin, it's mind boggling. Like my, my doctor is like, like, I can't believe how little insulin you take. Like in an average day, I'm probably taking maybe 21 units, including my basal. I'm 18. Yeah, I'm 17. So yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tip the scale. <laughs> Mine is significantly higher than all of yours. You have yeah. lots of other you got, issues. You got and that's, <laughs> I love you too, Paul. <laughs> I and, and we just, I just had an endo appointment this morning and we talked about it, but part of it, it's not my diet choices, right? Like that is one of the things I can control is what is the input for starches? What is, what does my diet look like? How does that play into it? But because of my dietary choices, I'm allowed to do the job that I love and that I do. Um, I have done it when I'm not low carb and, and my career now and my career then are massively different. And I don't think I would be looking at 20 years in the field if I was still trying to eat the sad diet. Um, I was seeing complications. I, that's a whole nother story, but my A1C is not 4.2 because we're seeing, you know, there's days I have that beautiful flat line. There's days that it flexes because of what I do. Um, but, but I know why, right? Like I know what that flex is from. And that's a personal decision that, you know, I'm okay with. Um, but I'm not worried about some of the other things that we normally would be. Um, yeah, the important yeah, so thing. We have to do one quick warning. One quick warning. Because we talked about DKA and insulin. Don't ever try and treat DKA at home. Mm -hmm. Don't go on the internet and ask for advice about what to do if you're in DKA. You go to the emergency room because if you treat yeah. DKA wrong, you will kill somebody because yeah. what happens is they get potassium depleted. And as soon as you hit them with a big slug of insulin, all that potassium pulls back out of their bloodstream and they have a heart attack. So yeah. do and, not- And I'm gonna, I'm gonna caveat on that and say also, right? Cause that be your own advocate, know that, yeah. right? Because Again, I love EMS and I love emergency medicine. That's what I do. That's what I'm passionate. But not all of our providers, especially in some of these little tiny rural hospitals, um, not everybody knows that. And so if you go into the ER and you're like, I think I'm in DKA, make sure they're just like, well, we're going to give you a bunch of insulin because you're high. 
make sure they don't do that because it will put you in the ICU faster than, and I've seen it happen, right? That's not just me throwing out there like, oh, yeah. we could, I've seen it happen. And, you know, don't, don't let them do that. Make sure that you know enough to be like, we can't, I'm not okay with that. Go to a different hospital, get a different provider, something. Um, and I'm also going to throw out there too, that if, because we see a lot of type two meds used in the type one community. Um, and my endo and I had a long conversation. Most of, most of my appointment this morning was talking about things like this. Um, but we, we had that conversation about, yeah, SGLT2s and their use versus, you know, and you have a potential for going into DKA at normal blood sugar levels. And that's not being mentioned to people. Um, so not only be aware that DKA exists, but learn the symptoms, especially if you're on these medications. Um, really do your homework on those, on those meds too right? There is things that we can address as somebody that's having insulin resistance that maybe don't involve those. Um, that's a decision that you guys have to kind of look into and make yourself, but know those signs and symptoms because you may have those signs and symptoms at 90 and not automatically assume that it's DK and it is. So we, we've got to educate too on what DKA actually looks like and that it's not it's not just ketones which you talked about but this is what it looks like so pay attention to this this isn't as big a deal is kind of we've missed that a little bit I think as a society too there's so much more we can talk about <laughs> we're gonna wrap this up it's been wonderful I don't know where the time went we really mm -hmm. should explore some of these topics further but thank you so much each one of you Sarah Bridget Paul I really appreciate your time this is going to be a fantastic episode I can't wait to put it out well I thank you for everything you do for us thank you thank you for hosting I guess really and I love you guys <laughs> I love you too Bye. -bye. <laughs>